Bio Info for Women seminar within the Severo Ochoa Research Seminar series at the BSC. Uh, thank you all for attending. We are thrilled to have so, so many people interested. Uh, just a few organizational notes. Um, this is a regular uh, Zoom meeting, but we will be asking you to stay muted during the presentation. And please ask any questions you may have during the presentation on the chat. You can do it open or you can do it uh, privately, for instance, to me, as you wish. When the presenter finishes, uh, we will first uh, address those questions in the chat, one by one, and then you will be able to raise your hand. There will be time for questions and to interact with the speaker. Okay, in the meantime, we please ask you to uh, remain muted just to prevent any issues uh, with the sound and so on. So now I will give uh, the word to Marta Villegas, who is the host, to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Alba, and thank you everyone for coming and joining us. So as you know, Marta Ruiz Cortajusa is a Ramon Cajal researcher at the UPC, Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, where he got her PhD. He has a wide experience. Her research experience is mainly in machine translation. He has been working in a good number of places. And so she was in the CRNS in Paris, also in Barcelona Media. Uh, at the University of Sao Paulo, in the Institute for Infocom Research in Singapore, also the Instituto Politécnico in Mexico and the University of Edinburgh. So she, she also has a, a wide experience in, in projects, in both in European and national projects. And he organized 10 workshops on, in, in top venues and published more than 100 papers. So she has been part of the editorial board of the Computer Speech and Language Journal. And, and she recently uh, received two Google Faculty Research Awards, one in 2019 and the other in, in, in 2019. So again, Marta, it's a pleasure to introduce you. And thanks for sharing your knowledge and your expertise in this hot topic, which is gender bias in NLP. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Marta, uh, for such a nice introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me in this seminar. Uh, I'm super happy to, to be here talking about this topic uh, that we have been doing research within our group. So uh, the, top, the things that I'm showing is not only from myself, but, but as part of research with our machine translation group at the UPC. Uh, so let's let's start the talk with this logic riddle. Some of you might be familiar with it, but some not. And the riddle says the following: A man and his son are in a terrible accident and are rushed to the hospital in critical care. The doctor looks at the boy and exclaims, "I can't operate on this boy. He is my son." So how? Can this be okay? So it's a man and his son. They both are uh, damaged. Uh, they they both have the, the accident, and in the hospital, the doctor says that it's his son. I mean, if you are not familiar, I'm sure that well, most of you do not come to the uh, answer, which is that the mother is the doctor, okay? Because we have a. Uh, uh, this logic riddle tries to associate that uh, tries to show that we have this association between doctors and males, and uh, we uh, have one stereotype that it's that females tend to be nurses and males tend to be doctors. Okay, and this is just one example from a long list of the occupation bias that we have where a computer programmer is associated to males, uh, where teachers tend to be females. And this brings us to what is defined as unconscious bias, which is the general term that are uh, uh, learned stereotypes that are automatic and intentional, universal. And this unconscious bias comes in many flavors, okay? From stereotypes where women are more related to be on a diet, 
and men are more associated to being heroes. Uh, to the bias of out of group homogeneity, okay, where we feel that the other groups are more homogeneous than ours. As an European, it is difficult for me to make a difference within certain Asian uh, faces, but the, the other way around. And there is a long list of types of biases that at the end uh, end up encoded in our reports, in our data collections. And um, the way we report things is even more biased in what we call human reporting bias, okay? So when we write, we tend to polarize things. So uh, the thing is, we as humans inherit and perpetuate biases, okay? And the question is, are the machines the solutions? Because I mean, we grow up in an environment that we start, uh, start our biases at a very young age. Okay, so it's very difficult for us to be neutral. But machines is different. So maybe it's the way to go, okay? Let's, let's explore uh, this. Uh, natural language processing focuses precisely on programming computers to process and analyze uh, uh, natural, uh, natural language, okay? Uh, so NLP applications just try to um, manage with natural language. And for example, we have machine translation, speech recognition, uh, and question answering. Okay, all, all these uh, things. Uh, nowadays, and especially with the new trend in deep learning, uh, natural language processing are fit from data. Okay, and this data comes from our data collections which we saw they are biased. So, oh, sorry about that. So data from different sources tend to have our biases, okay? Um, beyond these data sources, it's even worse that the way we collect data is for our applications is based on a selection that we do. Okay, and here we have a map of Amazon Mechanical Turk, which, which is a, a, a platform to uh, not only collect data, but annotate data and many things. Uh, and we see that most of the workers come from Europe and uh, United States. And this is not a representation of the, of the entire population, okay? So the way we select and annotate data is always is also biased. An example of our biased annotation is here with this coreference. Okay, coreference is the task where you match one pronoun with one uh, word that has appeared before. Okay, so here uh, we ask the annotator to to uh, make a reference from the uh, mention a uh, head to what it refers to, okay? So in the, this, in both sentences, the pronoun is ambiguous, okay? But if we have this stereotype, we would be associating her to secretary, because secretary is more associated to females, and his to physician, because uh, physicians are more associated to men, okay? So bias in data appears at least in the following terms. It is inherent in data, it reappears when collecting the data, and fin finally when annotating the data. All this is fed in our model, which is trained on these biases. And then we further interpret the results with more biases. Here we have an example of uh, an interpretation in our generalization bias. Okay, If we search for housekeeper and we get only pictures of women, women we might wrongly interpret that all housekeepers are women, okay? So what we get is that human data perpetuates human biases in NLP and uh, uh, because NLP learns from data. And the result that we get is a biased loop. So, mm, at the moment, machines is not the, uh, the solution to get rid of our biases, okay? Uh, let's discuss how to mitigate gender bias in natural language processing, okay? Uh, we're going to discuss in three terms, okay? How to properly evaluate, 
how to propose the biased algorithms, and finally, how to propose the generation of uh, balanced data. And here is where I mentioned that we, uh, I start presenting work that we have done within our group and uh, in cooperation with, with, with the members of this group. So uh, let's start on, 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 on what are uh, words embeddings. Oh, if you are familiar with, with words embeddings, uh, uh, words embeddings is the task of uh, transforming words into vectors more or less, okay, and, and these word vectors are uh, learned uh, by using the information of context, okay, so we learn uh, one word, word vector of a, of a word depending on the context it has appeared, okay. Uh, beyond uh, uh, word word embeddings, we have contextual words embeddings, okay, that go one step beyond uh, words embeddings and compute independent vector representations for words in different sentences, okay? So if we have uh, this um, Mary and Joanna play basketball in a wonderful way, uh, John is the protagonist in this year's school play, play, which is the same word, will have different vector representations in both sentences because it means a different thing. Whereas with words embeddings, we have only one vector representation for, for each word, okay? Uh, so there are, there are several approaches for, words embe uh, for contextual words embeddings, okay? Uh, here we have a few, and we are using uh, ELMO, okay? We are using ELMO because it uses words, entire words, whereas the other approaches, most of them use uh, sub-words, okay? So, so uh, 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 it splits the words in, in different pieces, okay? So that's, that's the main reason of, of, of using ELM. But let's go back to words embeddings, okay? And uh, which is, you have one single vector representation for each word, not different ones for, for the same work in different sentences. And there are works that prove that these embeddings encode biases. For example, Kalikstan replicates a spectrum of biases by showing that words embeddings relate concepts one uh, to attributes one and concepts two with attributes two. Okay, so here in the in the slides we have these examples. Okay, concepts one relates to attributes one and concepts two relates to attributes two. We see that there are morally neutral uh, biases such as buttercup, uh, daisy, lily are related to freedom, health, love, or on the other hand, and caterpillar leaf are related to unpleasant attributes. Okay, these are morally neutral. But then we see problematic biases related to race or gender that relate European American name to pleasant attributes and African American name to unpleasant adjectives. Okay, and finally, the last example is we see a reflection of distribution of gender with respect to careers. So, this is the context. We have a uh, uh, bias in our words embeddings. Okay, we want to study if contextual words embeddings uh, exhibit gender bias as well. Okay, uh, and, and, and we do this because, I mean, Contextual words embeddings is a little bit more complex than words embeddings. And since they are more complex and they learn from more data, maybe we expect that they can exhibit less bias. Okay? Let's, let's see about it. We propose three experiments uh, which have been previously used for words embeddings. Okay? And the experiments are the following. We uh, propose detecting gender space and dynamic bias, male and female bias words clustering, and uh, the classification approach for bias words. Okay? Um, we, we report results on, on contextual words embeddings and also the ones that have been reported for words embeddings, and they are not exactly comparable, but at least in absolute terms, we can know a, a notion of how the bias check varies. Okay? Apart from this, uh, well, oh, not apart, uh, in order to, uh, to do this uh, evaluation, these three experiments, uh, what we need, we use uh, the following list, okay? We use what we call definitional list, 
of 10 pairs, okay, that uh, examples of this list are he, she, man, woman, boy, girl, okay, so we have words that are definition, they have in, in, in uh, the information of gender, okay, then we have the bias list, which contain 1,000 words, 500 female bias and 500 male bias, and examples of this list are, for example, diet for female and hero for male, okay, and then we have an extended bias list, which is the same but longer. And then finally, we have a professional list, okay, where we have uh, around 300 tokens of neutral professions. And we go to the first experiment. What we do is we randomly sample sentences that contain words from the definitional list, okay? We have the, defi uh, we swap the definitional word with its pairwise equivalent from the opposite gender. We get the Elmo embeddings for the word and its swap equivalents and compute the difference. And on the difference of these vectors, we compute the principal components to verify the presence of bias. Okay? And we do the same, but for a list of random words. Okay? So, and we get the following. In the left, we have the percentage of variance explained in the PC uh, in the principal, sorry, in the principal component analysis of the definitional vector differences, and in the right we have the corresponding percentage of for random vectors. Okay, in the in the case of, of having of not working with the with the definitional list. Okay, what we see is in the uh, in the graphic on the left, we see that there is much more information in the first uh, principal uh, component. And we assume that this is the information of gender, okay? So we assume that our vectors encode the gender, okay, somehow. And then what we do is we use this gender information to measure the direct bias, okay? By measuring the, cos the cosine similarity between the gender vector and the neutral professions that we have from our professional list that I mentioned about 300 works, okay? And we see that with words and bearings, we get this, this direct bias, this measure of similarity, which in the, it, in the original work that it was uh, 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 proposed and explored, it was considered as substantial bias. And with ELMO, this substantial bias is reduced. Okay, but still, it's, it's present, okay, because there is a similarity between the, what was these neutral professions should be, uh, should be neutral, should not encode any information of bias, but we see that they encode, okay. Then we go to the second experiment, okay, and the second experiment is about clustering word vectors. We get the bias list, which contains 500 words, get the sentences for those words, and get the representation of those words and apply commits. What we see is that we get two clusters for those words. And bias words related to female are um, in, in this yellow, and, and, and male words are, are, are in purple, okay? And we, we see an accuracy with the ELMO embeddings of 70%. What we would like to see here would be a 50%, okay? Because we do not want to cluster uh, words that are supposed to be neutral efficiently, okay? So uh, the, the lower the accuracy, that would be random 50%, because we are clustering between two classes, is what we would like to see. Uh, it's better than with words embeddings themselves, okay? So these contextual words embeddings get uh, less information, uh, less biased information, but still we have some. And the, the last experiment, okay, is um, we want to classify words from the extended bias list, okay? So the bigger list that we have into male and female. And we use 1,000 words for training and uh, 4,000 words for testing. And we get an accuracy of 85%, which is huge again, okay? Again, it's better than words and bearings, but uh, still we have uh, uh, this big number, okay? We wouldn't like to have such a high accuracy. 
And now, uh, okay, this is the experiment on how to measure uh, bias. And now let's see, uh, let's do a visual visualization of these vectors that I'm talking all the time of these contextual sports embeddings, okay? And let's see a, a visualization. What we do, this, you know that these vectors are highly dimensional. And to visualize them, what we do is a reduction of space using view map techniques to map them in a bidimensional space so that we can see where they are placed, these vectors. Okay, and uh, here what we uh, look is for the representation of a uh, perso personal financial advisor. Okay, for the for 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 uh, I have um, I want to see the representation of these three words. Okay, in different sentences. Okay, uh, the sentences are the ones I'm showing. I've known him for a long time. My friend works as a personal financial advisor. And the other sentence is, I know her for a long time, my friend works as a personal financial advisor. Okay, so the meaning of the sentence is the same, it's just that we change the pronoun, okay? And what we get is that the uh, advisor, financial and personal, both in male and female sentences, are placed in the same point in the space. Great, that is what we want. So these words, uh, this representation of words, is not biased in the sense that they are uh, neutral words, they are uh, in sentences that mean the same thing, the only thing that differs is the pronoun, so super great. But what happens when I change the, sen when I change the words that, that I want to see the, the, the representation? When my words are financial manager. So then now the sentence is the, it's similar structure, but I, I want to see the representation of financial manager, okay? And what I see is that here, the representation of financial and manager in the male sentence, it's in this point in the space here at the top. Whereas financial manager, the representation for, female, for the female sentence is in this part of the space. See that they are different representation for, again, neutral words that should be represented equally. So here, what we get, obviously, just one example. So we, 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 differently from previous measures, this is not an objective measure, but it's just to show you the intuition that there is a bias. Uh, because managers are more associated to male uh, than female. So uh, the representation of manager in a, uh, in a, 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 a financial, in a male sentence is different than in the higher. So our conclusions on evaluating gender bias in contextual words embeddings uh, is that uh, contextual words embeddings seem to mitigate bias when measuring in the following aspects, gender as space and direct bias, male and female clustering and classification experiment. In all those terms, it seems that we get less bias than we, with the standard words embeddings. However, what we see is that they preserve bias. Okay, now uh, that's all for evaluation. What, now what I'm going to show is uh, the biased algorithm for machine translation. And uh, we can see uh, some examples of machine translation. Uh, here uh, we have an example where we translate from English to Turkish on the left. When we translate from English to Turkish and back then to to English, and what we get is that uh, she is a doctor. It's translated into Turkish, or be doctor. I don't know how to pronounce it. And then we get he is a doctor. Okay, here what you could say is that okay, Turkish does not concern, uh, does not maintain gender information. And then, since it is neutral, when you back translate to English, you do not know if it's a female or if it's a male. Okay, here okay, uh, it just a wrong translation, but a human could perform also this bad translation. But here on the right, we have a contextual translation that it's uh, it, from Malay to English, and we have the second sentence is, Jeseline is a female, he works as a programmer. So here we know that Jeseline is a female. And even with that, we are saying he works as a programmer. What we are assuming is that the stereotype of a programmer being a male is stronger that what the system learns from co-reference, okay? Because this he should be a she because we know that we are talking about a female, okay? So 
our, uh, uh, what we get from here is that our machine translation systems are biased and we can show many examples, okay? And there are some solutions to these examples in providing, for example, what is gender specific translation. So when, when the translation system does not know exactly if it's a male or if it's a female, uh, he can provide both translations, okay? Uh, but I want to talk about a straightforward approach that we have followed, and it is that within the architecture of machine translation, which is a transformer, we have introduced some debiased words and values, okay? So in the, in the training of a machine translation system, there is the technique of learning words and values, okay? What we have talked in the, in the first part of evaluation, okay? And there, there have been in the literature uh, some, um, two techniques basically, okay? To the various words and values that have been uh, previously presented, okay, in, in, in other words. So one of them is that the biasing after training by define a gender direction, okay? So uh, we define a gender direction, uh, as, as I have mentioned with a, with a principal component analysis, and we define inherently neutral words, nurse as opposed to mother, okay? Nurse is a neutral word, mother is not, okay? And then we set up uh, the projection of all neutral words on the gender direction. Okay, and we remove the direction from those words. Okay, so, so neutral words, we, we remove the information of gender in neutral words. Okay, and this is the uh, one technique that we call the bias uh, words and banks. Then uh, we have another technique that is the bias during training. Okay, we train words and bearings, uh, uh, well, the literal. Um, we train words and bearings, we alter the laws to encourage the gender information to concentrate in the last coordinate, and then we ignore uh, the gender information simply by removing the last coordinate, okay? Uh, both of these procedures still encode bias, but uh, they mitigate the, they mitigate the bias, okay? And first, what we want to see, and I'm showing with this table, is that using these uh, both techniques of, of uh, mitigating bias in, in words embeddings, uh, we do not uh, damage the translation, okay? So our translation quality is the same, okay? Because we want to get rid of bias, but without losing translation quality. So here, what we have is uh, uh, blue is a measure to evaluate the translation quality, okay? And the larger, the, the, the higher is the blue, the better translation quality that we have. Okay, so our uh, baseline system, without having uh, external words embeddings or modification of words embeddings, is uh, this uh, 29.78. Uh, when we use external words embeddings without the biasing them, we get an improvement. And then when using uh, the device techniques, we see that we always get an improvement compared to the baseline, but uh, in some cases it's, it's lower than using non-device embeddings. But in any case, we do not, we do not lose uh, quality in the, in the translation, okay? And then we want to measure, okay, so now we know that, that our technique does not damage the translation. Now we want to measure if there is any improvement in the bias in our system. And for this, what we built is four test sets of one very similar uh, uh, to each other uh, of 1,000 sentences on the patterns uh, uh, that I'm showing here, okay? Uh, we have in English, I've known him for a long time. My friend works as a, and we have this list of occupations, okay? And we have the corresponding translation uh, in Spanish, okay? And the challenge here is to translate my friend into the corresponding correct amigo or amiga, okay? If I'm talking about her or him. And then test three and test four is the same, but instead of using her or him, we use Mary and John, okay? And uh, then what we get is the accuracy of translating properly into amigo or amiga. And what we see is that the baseline system uh, does not do very well when, when, when translating uh, uh, Mary, uh, in this case, the system, uh, the accuracy 
in this case is uh, quite low. Uh, it does not translate in all cases to amiga. It sometimes misses and translates to amigo. It does not learn that Mary is a, is a female, okay? Uh, whereas for the, for example, the case of uh, the bias uh, words embeddings, we get in this case 100% accuracy. We do not get it with the, with the other um, uh, word embedding neutralization, okay? But we get it with this, okay? So with this, uh, the bias word embedding technique, which is the one uh, to the bias um, uh, bef bef uh, after training, okay? Not during training. Uh, so what we get is that the conclusions is that uh, when using equalized words embeddings on a machine translation system, we show that we have similar translation quality and we have less bias gender predictions. The limitations are that we are based on the bias uh, words embeddings, which are not truly the biased, okay? We can only say that they, are, they mitigate bias. And also that we are relearning biases during machine translation uh, training probably because we are using only as a initialization of the words embeddings. And finally, okay, we have shown evaluation, we have shown how to divide as machine translation. Uh, now let's talk about uh, generating uh, fair data sets, okay, because one of the problems nowadays is that we are training with uh, imbalanced data, okay. And uh, for example, one word that has been presented in this line is, well, different, but uh, is one that uh, it uh, mentions uh, who is the speaker, okay? Because that, that is the following problem. When I'm translating from English into uh, French, for example, and I'm talking uh, personally, uh, uh, in the case I am happy that I do not know if I is a female or I is a male. If I know the gender of the speaker, I will be able to translate properly in Spanish, in French, in Catalan, and so on. So here, what they have done is create a multilingual data set with the information of this speaker. And this helps in the translation. But uh, the, the approach that I want to mention, the one that we have done, it goes in a different direction Okay, but it also uh, uh, deals with data in the sense that we have all this data and here we are showing uh, a collection of uh, books uh, that shows that the male representation is much higher than the female representation. Okay, and this happens in most of the test sets that we have. Okay, so what we are doing is we are using the laser toolkit, okay, that it, it, it uses, uh, it extracts, because what we need in machine translation are sentences that are the translation of each other. And Wikipedia, what it has is comparable documents, but not aligned sentences. But this toolkit uh, extracts documents from the Wikipedia and extracts a sentence, a parallel sentence automatically from the Wikipedia. Okay, we have used this toolkit to adapt it to uh, 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 a new toolkit that we call GeoView Toolkit, that what we are doing is from the biographies of the Wikipedia, we are extracting parallel data. And by using only the biographies, we can filter and make 50% male and 50% female, and extract multi, uh, multilingual parallel data that it's balanced in gender. Okay, and uh, what we do, uh, we do this procedure, okay, and we want to evaluate if our ex automatic extraction of parallel sentences is accurate, okay? And to, do, to evaluate our toolkit, we randomly select 50 sentences in three languages, English, Spanish, and Catalan. We uh, you, uh, ask seven different native uh, fluent speakers, uh, to score a tuple of three sentences, with one if it conveys the same meaning or zero otherwise, and then we compute the majority vote about uh, evaluators and we reach 96% uh, accuracy. And uh, the, um, the interrogation agreement of uh, the CAPA is 0 0.667, which is considered a substantial agreement. 
Okay, so with this, what we have is a multilingual uh, parallel data uh, of high quality that it's balanced in gender. Okay, apart from this uh, GeoView toolkit, what we do is also um, annotate uh, uh, 2,000 sentences, okay, in English, Spanish, and Catalan, and we post process them so that uh, they are perfect translations. So instead of having this 96% uh, accuracy, we have 100%. So we can use this set as a gold standard, okay? And we add also the information, the topic information of the, of the biographies. And, and well, uh, this is an example of, of this corpus that has uh, document information uh, that is aligned at the level of sentence and then that it uh, has topic information and the gender information as well. Apart from this, and I have just uh, added it uh, recently because we have done this just uh, less than one month ago uh, with a, 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 a group of students, uh, is that, I don't know if you are familiar with this, with this um, initiative, okay, that it's um, data sheets for data sets. Okay, this is one initiative that, that was proposed by Timid Hebrew in 2018. Okay, and the idea is that all uh, the, the, the microchips have these data sheets that allow us to know certain specifications of the chips. So it would be nice to have a data sheet for each data set. Okay, so that we have information about that, our data sets and we know if information about them, if they are where they have been collected, uh, which number of languages covered. I mean, several important things that allow us to know with which data sets we are training our systems, okay? And uh, we realized that uh, even if this was proposed in 2018, there were no data sheets uh, done documented for machine translation databases, okay? So what we have done is adapt these data sheets for machine translation and modify certain questions and orient them so that people can get motivated to document all these data sets that we have in machine translation. And what we have done also is uh, open a repository, okay, where, you, where we can collect this uh, documentation that will be nice to know uh, details of the data sets that we are training with so that we are, uh, know in advance what biases to expect from our systems. And the conclusions on, on these uh, initiatives on fair data sets is that uh, GBO Toolkit allows to extract multilingual gender balanced data sets and that empty data sheets allows for documenting uh, data sets. And now uh, just some global conclusions of all that I've talked about. Uh, is this the biasing what we want? Okay. Um, it is difficult to scale this gender bias that we are showing here, simplify it only uh, for male and female and not extending to, uh, to more types of, uh, to more gender. So uh, this is a very toy example, okay, of all the biases that we have, okay? Uh, also, also, and, and uh, I don't know, but uh, we have, I want to point it, I, I didn't have it here, but just recently there's been a very nice work from Blodgett and company uh, that it's posted in archive and it's um, criticizing the way uh, gender bias is dealt in natural language processing in general, in the sense uh, this, this, the researchers that have uh, uh, positively criticized, okay, it's, it's been super nice, uh, are, from, are not from natural language processing field, and they mention that we are uh, dealing with the problem in a very simplistic way, okay? So, uh, this is to join these authors, and it's true, we are doing a very simplistic way, uh, but it's in the sense that it's a very complex problem, so it's, I guess it's better to start with something simplistic so that we can later extend. Okay. Uh, also, another question, uh, and this is more from the machine learning perspective, is 
is the biasing always desirable in the sense that machine learning is about extracting patterns, okay? So removing bias is sometimes uh, removing uh, these patterns that, that, that we are learning. But uh, in general, my answer to this, uh, uh, to this comment would be that uh, gender information in natural language systems, it becomes harmful when the use of this system has a negative impact on people's lives. Okay, so we do not want to learn patterns that are harmful for the society. That's, that's the thing, okay? Even if our systems are better uh, or perform better in some gold standard, okay? So uh, uh, gender bias, and this is, comes to my first comment, is a social phenomenon, okay, that cannot be solved within the community of natural language processing. We need to collaborate with uh, social scientists, social linguistics, philosophers. I mean, it's a highly multidimensional uh, topic and we need a, a high uh, multidisciplinary multi uh, uh, collaboration, a multidisciplinary collaboration. Arguments for doing research in this topic is that unconscious bias can be really harmful. Uh, the bias in computer systems might help in the bias in society. So coming to my first question is the, are the, that I did at the very beginning, are the machine translation the solution to our bias problems? I think that they can be if we, uh, if we uh, really want them to be, okay? Because uh, it's very difficult to take away the biases that a person has, okay? So it's very difficult. I mean, I think that we would, need to travel a lot, talk with a different people and do things that sometimes is difficult to do to get rid of half of the biases that we have. But with a machine, it's trainable. So you can change the data that you have trained your algorithms and you, your machine changes the opinion, okay, it has. So uh, I think that machines is a solution for this. And uh, another uh, motivation is that gender bias causes NLP systems to make errors in general, okay? So uh, one thing is that uh, you should care about uh, gender bias, even if accuracy is all you care about, okay? Uh, there are several ways that we can do to fight the biasing. One is at the machine level. Uh, we can worry about balanced data, about documenting our data, about, um, how we train our algorithms, in what gold standards we test our algorithms, if they, our gold standards are representative. And in the evaluation, of course, we need, uh, we need ways to evaluate our improvements. And finally, at the human level, uh, we can uh, provide rules for the, I lost for this, so that the systems that uh, are uh, shown to what used by the community, they have to be um, follow it. They have to follow certain rules. Okay, uh, they have to uh, know. They have to be at least somehow interpretable. We have to. They have to be trained on documented data sets, for example, and things like this. Uh, of course, we can organize diversity, diversity workshops. Uh, we can uh, pro promote ethics education of our engineers, and well, many more things that I'm not citing here. And uh, well, um, I'm happy to take questions now. And this is the end of, of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marta. Very interesting. Everything. I think now it's time for for questions. No. Thank you very much, uh, Marta. Um, so there's some questions first in the or comments first in the chat. So we will address this first, and then you can raise your hand. Uh, we will take note and give you give you word to speak out out loud. Um, so in the chat, uh, Alfonso, you would like uh, to comment anything? You were the first one to mention. Thanks, thanks for the for the talk. Uh, very interesting and challenging. Uh, my first comment, <laughs> and take it as an anecdote, is that the, the example that is commonly used, your first example 
of the medical doctor, you have to be careful with this example because how things are going, the, uh, the child can have two fathers and one can be in the car and the other can be the doctor. So be careful because depending on where you give this uh, example, you may have, <laughs> you may find um, um, people that may not like it. Uh, thank you for that, Alfonso. And, and that's what I addressed in, 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 in some part of the presentation. And I mentioned that, that we are uh, here uh, simplifying for uh, starting with something we are doing. I know, I know. I don't, don't, take it, don't take it, don't take it, don't take it, uh, don't take it uh, as a, uh, it's just that I will not, you know, I will not start the talk with this example. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you don't want to have uh, someone offended from, from minute one. Um, and more seriously speaking, uh, I mean, there are a number of uh, just just two uh, two questions. Uh, you, you mentioned at some point the difference between uh, uh, the biasing after training or during training, and your results after training were better, far better than during training. What in a sense is 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 I, I will interpret this. Uh, uh, what is your interpretation? Of this uh, I will interpret this as a, as a bad bad news, no? Because you want to have a process that is doing the, the biasing during the training and not just by filtering after training. Uh, yeah, here what, what I can say about these experiments, okay, is that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a little bit misleading in the sense that we are using these algorithms of words embeddings only as a um, initialization in the transformer, okay? So we here, we have what we have, this is the structure of, the, of our neural machine translation system, okay? And we have here some embeddings for the source sentence and some embeddings for the target sentence, okay? And normally these embeddings are trained always within uh, the machine while you are training the machine translation system, okay? But what we are doing here is that these embeddings, instead of being randomly initialized, initialized as, it's, as it, is, it is standard in nowadays in neural machine translation, uh, what we are doing is uh, st uh, initializing them with the biased uh, uh, words embeddings, okay? That are that have been pre-trained and they are the biased. So here the uh, for you just to get, I mean, they, 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 they are a lot of things coming into play, okay? First of all, that we are retraining these uh, embeddings within the, while we are learning the translation, okay? Because normally, uh, if you freeze the embeddings from the initial and, and you don't learn them within the task, uh, you have uh, worse results in what is the translation quality, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have to retrain. So in retraining them, we are changing them. Okay, mm -hmm. so we are not really sticking to these two uh, embeddings, okay, uh, that we have. Uh, so there are many things that are intervening here that, that, that are not uh, making them uh, fixed. Okay, so in this sense, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that words embed the bias we is better than gender neutral glove. Okay, that I'm not saying that this technique is better yeah. than this one. It's I'm saying that it's better in our context and with our formulation. Okay, okay I understand. So it's not in another way of saying that it's not strictly after training. Indeed, you are checking them all the time during training. Exactly because because of that, okay. Because I'm not using words embeddings yeah. at as 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 an end by themselves, okay. I'm using them as part of the neural machine translation system. The other question I put in the in the is also a comment on the on the chat is, I mean, the way you presented the talk is divided in in, in three blocks, no, uh, uh, assessing and then uh, the performance and then uh, a way of correcting. In a sense, all these can be seen as part of the same, uh, in practice, all these can be integrated, no? because you will be assessing the systems and then proposing how to, you can use the, the results of the assessment 
to correct the system or to correct the training data for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the given process. No? They, they don't have to be disconnected in practice. You can feed the results of the assessment in the, that you show in the first place to correct the data set or to correct the training. Uh, uh, yeah, but the thing is that, okay, uh, what I, uh, I, if, I don't know if I, uh, you, you mean that I, I, I presented three, uh, three blocks uh, somehow disconnected that I didn't yeah. put them together? Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in this sense, I mean, um, yeah, I could, for example, I could uh, plug together the various algorithms with the balanced data sets, okay, because the balanced data set is a multilingual, uh, uh, a multilingual, in fact, we are kind of doing, is a multilingual um, parallel corpus, okay, that we can train our machine translation systems. And if we train on balanced data set and we also use the biased algorithms, I think that our system will do, will do fairly uh, much better in what is um, biasing. Mm -hmm. But for the evaluation part, okay, uh, uh, the, the evaluation that I showed is in contextual words embeddings, okay, not in machine translation. So in that sense, that evaluation, uh, uh, no. it's more, that's why no. I'm calling the, it's natural language process. No, no, I'm, 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 I was not thinking, I was more uh, thinking in a, uh, not in the explicit uh, case, but in a more, um, in a more general sense that these three operations, don't have to be separated that you can no they could be just part of the same or the same system they can be integrated that you learn from the from the bias of what you have to do on the uh, from the evaluation what you learn about the bias can be integrated in how you train the data and how you uh, uh, say this is feedback to how you evaluate the system so and, and it's more it's more a conceptual question no? that by, by you show the examples and your work in three, in three blocks, but it's okay. But conceptually speaking, all this could be integrated. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's that's the idea, no? Okay, that that we have to work in 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 three in uh, in three direction and, and and maybe even more. Okay, and yes, of course, these three parts four part uh, are 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 part of the same system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally agree. My last comment is about the, the, the annotations uh, that you propose uh, of the corpus. Uh, that is a very interesting, uh, say, interesting and needed idea. Part of the annotations will be uh, uh, the results themselves. No, if I use a corpus and I get some results that they are evaluated in terms of bias, for example. The results of I have used this corpus and I obtained these results uh, that show this uh, previous this bias is part of the the description of the data itself. Now that one thing is to sit there and, and do a description of a, of a given corpus, and you showed you call this uh, I forgot the name. Um, uh, it's, I, you know, it's always difficult to ask people to do annotations of data. Maybe a way of doing the automatic annotation of the data is to do the annotation by the type of results that are produced in different systems. Uh, sorry, I, I, I don't... Uh, you, you, I don't you, you, were, you were explaining the, uh, a case or a, an initiative to annotate data set. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking that part of the annotations of the data sets are the results that are obtained with this data set, at least in other, in other areas. I can, I, can, I can see this is, you know, there is a, a given data set in genomics and it's difficult to describe the data set. You can do some description, but at the same time, we know that these descriptions in terms of fair data or something are always difficult to, 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 to do because you never know how the data set is going to be used. So maybe, the results of the use of the data set in with different methods are part of the description of the data set. But in this case, it was a very uh, easy annotation, okay, in both, okay. In, in one, it just to evaluate, okay. So we just asked the annotators to, to, to see if, if, if it was a translation or not, an accurate translation or not. 
and in this one it was uh, to provide um, it was simply a correction of the of the of the of the of the corpus itself okay so it was yeah I know I'm, not, I'm not referring to your data to you said what you propose is a, a systematic uh, attempt to annotate data sets that you show the I don't know, it's later on your talk, it's good to do it without the... This? No. Yeah, this one, yes. No, this is not to annotate my data set. This is to, to document. The this is what I mean, that documented the data set. And not uh, annotating, which is totally different. Well, okay, true. <laughs> documenting, the, documenting data set, sorry. Documenting data set. Part of the documentation of the data set is the use of the data set, the results of the use of the data set. We have the same problem in many other areas, no? Documenting what is a data set is, uh, is fine, but it's always misleading when you're going to use it because you always use the data set for something different. And part of the documentation of the data set is how the data set, what are the kind of results that the data set are producing with different methods. Yeah, but I, I don't know if you have checked this, this data sheet, okay? And it simply uh, performs some questions. Maybe if you want, we can, we can, we can visit, uh, because, uh, but it, it, it performs some, um, it's quite extensive, okay? Uh, okay, let me. Uh, what I'm saying that this is the, this is uh, expensive in terms of people ah, yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, uh, thinking in ways of uh, to say, doing this for automatically the thing that we'll use will be the results of different systems that have been using the data no? it's, uh, this data has been used for the, this paper that is doing that with these results. That's probably tell me more about the data set than uh, uh, in, a, in a cheaper way, in a more automatic way. Mm, not totally, Lee, because uh, I mean, I, I, what you want at least, what you want to do if, if, if is, uh, I'll, what I visualize this data sheet uh, to be useful is. Uh, um, uh, to understand if the data set that I'm using to train my system is fair enough, okay? Because, for example, it has questions like, uh, who created the data set? Uh, who funded the creation of the data set? Okay? Uh, what uh, what uh, instances that compress the data set represent? Documents, photos, people, countries. How many instances are there in total, okay? Um, what does the set contains all possible instances? So is there a label or a target associated with each instance? Is there any information using individual instances? Okay, this is, as you say, this is time consuming. It's difficult to, to get, but what I visualize this initiative is more not uh, uh, to know if I can use this data set to train a fair data, the, uh, 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 NLP system, okay? to train a fair translation, for example, okay? Because depending on who has funded that data set, I will know that it's, I don't know, politically... Uh... No, 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 that's, no I, I, I'm not saying that there's any, anything bad with us. I'm saying that it's expensive. But I was thinking that the, the a complementary approach is to say, now I'm using my system for assessing biases and I'm annotating these data. This data is very biased when I use it with this program but already will tell me a lot about what can I use this data for or not. That the results of the evaluation of the methods of the, of the paper that have been using the data can be part of this annotation as a complementary source of information about what this data set is about. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's difficult to, for example, in machine translation to, to know in all the systems that has been used one data set. I mean, this is... Um, we should move to next question. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you. <laughs> so, Davide, uh, you also wanted to comment. Yeah, uh, hi, Marta. Uh, really nice presentation. 
my question is, uh, is, I mean, it, it's very straightforward. I was uh, wondering, like, uh, how to recognize that there is a, an harmful uh, uh, bias in the first place in an automatic way. I mean, we humans look at the data, look at those differences, and we see that it's not fair, and we have some ethical criteria not to evaluate this uh, afterwards, maybe too late. So I was wondering, like, how is it possible to, uh, to do this evaluation uh, in an automatic way? So basically how to recognize um, biases, so artifacts, um, and distinguish them to genuine differences that, uh, that exist. Thank you, David. I mean, I, this is a very complex question, and that's why that's why I start, I guess, my 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 talk with the, with the evaluation uh, uh, phase. Okay, showing how difficult it is to evaluate biases in words embeddings, no? And what are the these are just three proposals that have been out of I don't know at least more than ten measures more or something. And uh, it, I do not think that we have an answer for this uh, still in the field, uh, because it would be very nice to have a measure like, like the one that I show for machine translation, like the Bleu measure, okay, where you know, okay, a lot of people has a lot of criticisms with the Bleu measure in machine translation, but at least it's an objective measure that more or less it has been the field progress because it's objective and I mean, you might criticize it, but people agree it would be super nice to have such a measure in the bias thing but i do not think that we can uh, have such a measure because um in each uh, each uh, application uh, machine translation sentiment analysis question answering would have a, a different i mean to define the criteria of the bias in each of that applications I mean, uh, it, it is already difficult, so uh, I do not think that we can have a measure that, that, that provides bias for all these things. Uh, it, should not, uh, it should not like be limited to, to the field, but uh, instead be something, for instance, that uh, leverage, I don't know, like um, socioeconomical uh, impact of uh, uh, observations, you know? and uh, like, you know, try to connect, for instance, NLP, uh, applications with something more societal, something like from which we can get data and, and evaluate if it is actually like having a negative impact in some minorities or... or yeah. Uh, uh, I think, and, 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 and you raised a question that I think it's, it's discussed in this paper that I mentioned, this new paper of Logit, that, 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 that it's important that in the research that we do, we mention the, the harm, um, the represent, the allocational harm and the representational harm and so on. But it's something more that we have to comment uh, and it's already difficult to uh, discuss it um, already manually. So I think that uh, automatically, it, I mean, we are far from that. But it's, it's, it's something that we have to address at least in when uh, starting our, uh, I don't know, when starting an experiment in bias, we have at least to uh, verbalize it uh, and, and point it out. Uh, what is the harm that, for example, the machine translation is doing uh, when uh, reflecting stereotypes, okay? That would be one 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 thing, no? Okay, so so if the machine translation system is uh, amplifying stereotypes, I mean this is, uh, I mean we do not want certain professions to be associated to males and certain to women. It can be quantified. So. Exactly. Then I had another question, but I pass it to Osnat that has a similar one. So let's. Uh, ah, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. So, yeah, how's that, please? You're muted, does not. We cannot hear you. Can yes, you hear me now? now? Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, thank you for the talk. It's very, it was very interesting. Uh, you mentioned that, I, I, I don't know if I understood correctly, maybe you'll correct me, that the main corpus was the English-German news corpus, 
and then you looked at Turkish translation, French translation. Do you have any insights about uh, the cultural context? Basically, what kind of, of bias may, may vary between cultures, for example, or, be, or even if you're looking at news versus something like Wikipedia, you're probably looking at different types of issues? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, what is, uh, I mean, this is why I mentioned that it's super complex, okay? What is bias for me, you are right, maybe for the, for another culture it's not bias at all, yeah, so no. Uh, uh, we took, for example, the list that we have here to em evaluate bias, that it's uh, this list that we are mentioning here, okay? What is this bias list? Uh, this was uh, proposed by several previous works, okay, one of them, the, the first uh, paper that I learned from, 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 from bias, uh, bias, that was the bias in words and bearings, man is from Bolubasi, okay, man is to computer programmer as woman is a, a housekeeper, okay, and, and it's taken from this list, uh, uh, the ones that they are, that they did with Amazon Mechanical Turk and, and also they ex it was extended by some later work, okay? So these, these lists are, and the, what we assume that it's bias is from this, this list, okay? So again, a bias list that it's proposed from the US and, and I mean, European, I mean, all these parts of the world that, that, that it's not representative of the entire world. So, yeah, uh, this is a problem. What is bias for some countries, some nationalities might not in another ones. So the least I can only say that, that it's from previous work. I mean, yeah, it's assuming that. I mean, can you say something about how inherent it is to the language because, uh, and how much of it is, uh, maybe it's a little bit a repetition on what David asked and how much of it is really cultural, how much of it is linguistic and how much of it is, uh, for example, in the reality, can you separate these things, twist them out depending on the type of corpus or, or not really at this stage? Uh, I mean, it's very interesting the bias associated with the language, okay? Because I mean, there are things like why the sun is feminine in some cultures and why the sun is masculine in some other cultures. So uh, I, I know that there is a lot of literature in that point in the, from the social uh, community. And I think that that's why I have a lot to read from that part. And that's uh, another best practice that we have proposed in the workshop of gender bias that we are proposing. We are uh, about to, to, to propose things like this, no? okay? We, we want to force uh, uh, papers to have mentions to the literature of, social, of the social part of social sciences. And we want uh, to, to verbalize these handful of statements that we have uh, uh, commented with the video. So at the moment, uh, no, I, I, I don't know how much, I, I do not have an idea of how to deal with, with how associate the bias to languages automatically and how to measure it. And, uh, but I want to learn. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Osna. So, uh, Alvaro, just wanted to ask. Uh, some yes. Questions. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much, Marta, for the presentation. It was very clear. And biases are, are crucial when it comes to data analysis in, in um, to machine learning, in gender, and really in any other property in, in any field. So my question is really related to the previous two questions that have been made by Davide and Osnat, and is that how does the correction of, of biases relates to the frequency of appearance in reality? For instance, I have written an, an example related to the cultural uh, environment uh, when translating this sentence, Andrea uh, is tall from English to Spanish. If you are considering an Spanish environment uh, where Andrea, Andrea is mainly a female name, you would say Andrea es alta. But when, if, if you are considering an Italian environment where Andrea is mainly a, a male name, you would say Andrea es alto. So um, how, 
how, how do you um, relate the correction of bias to to this frequency thank you this is very challenging this is very challenging and 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 uh, I mean, it's difficult to, to address this problem uh, because, uh, again, this is about one challenge that we have in translation, okay, that it's grounding translation, okay? And this is very interesting and, and there is a lot of, well, starting the problem, this would be grounding, okay? This is more than a problem of bias, what we, you are saying, it's more a problem of grounding, okay? of relating the, the, the machine translation to the reality, okay? And this is one limitation that in general our deep learning algorithms have. Uh, I mean, we are learning a lot about our examples and our patterns, but we are learning very little from the reality, okay? And that's uh, what is missing nowadays and, and that we have to progress in, in that sense, okay? So this is a, a, a very interesting problem that, that that uh, we are interested in, 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 in starting as well, that the community is, is starting, and it's grounded translation. And it's introducing this context, and I, I don't know, I mean, mm, it's, in fact, <laughs> I don't know if you can read, but here this is, experience grounds language. I mean, this is something that I have to study, but I, I, I mean, uh, um, I don't know, I don't know exactly how to start, but, but I think that they are interesting lines to, to start with and, and we can do. Uh, but definitely this will uh, uh, add a lot of um, improvements in the current systems not not just only in machine translation but also in speech recognition for example if you I, I mean you know more information about your speaker you will perform much less errors as well so yeah all right thank you very much thank you, thank you. one very quick last questions maybe marta marta villegas Yes, thanks. Lots of Marta's here. A small question. Can you hear me? Yeah. It, it's how did you build the list of uh, bias towards? Yeah, that's what I was mentioning. We took it from previous research. And this oh. was built using Amazon Mechanical Talk. It was, uh, this list are very, uh, very well done, I think. I mean, um, uh, they, they were, uh, uh, I mean, collected and then revised, and so the, the procedure was quite. But at least, uh, I also they are leaves, no, and they are coming from a part of the world what we mentioned. So, so I, I mean, although they followed a very scientific procedure, uh, I mean, they could okay. be more representative as well. Thanks, and then just just a, a small comment. I mean. I don't know if you agree, but I think that there is a difference between gender bias in language, which is essentially, I don't know, uh, but it can be reduced to, to see what uh, reference, no co-reference uh, problems, right? So to distinguish between gender bias and androcentric uh, view of the world, right? So I, I remember when I was a child at, at the school, a teacher told us that the democracy started in ancient Greece because citizens were allowed to vote, right? But in this case, citizens, which is a neutral word, didn't include women, right? So this is not gender bias. I mean, you cannot do something uh, from the point of view of natural language processing there, right? It's just uh, another thing, right? So I don't know, just, just to... Uh, if you share this 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 view so you mentioned that that i don't i'm not sure i'm i'm getting your 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 point which is sounds really interesting but it's the thing that that uh, for example when when we are talking now about the plurals that it's masculine instead yeah. of so well, there is, because that linguistically on surface there is something that you can you can identify as a linguist no as a natural yeah which processing but things like this you know when when citizens include women the word citizen right in yeah, yeah. women and not that's that's something that you cannot 
no? Uh, even attempt to, to... Yeah, and when we en you enter in these things, I mean, it's really, the French have come up with some really uh, complicated terms also. They, uh, I don't know now the details, but they have, uh, they have uh, uh, started, I mean, this is very difficult and, and this... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now, now we are in those things, like we say, Unidas Podemos, no? And yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's curious because for me, when I say um, uh, Als Nens or something, and I talk with my children, uh, they, they t the, uh, 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 my, my daughter tells, ah, you are not including me. And I said, look at what I said, the Nens, because for me, Nens, it's all of them. And, yeah. and, and for them, it's not. You have to say Nens and Nenas. If not, they are not included. I said, come on. And that's what, I mean, a, a colleague from the university said, I mean, come on, if we can all be nenas. I don't mind, but don't make me tell nens and nenas because it's very <laughs> inefficient. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, this is a complicated point that I, I do not have a strong opinion of that, except that I prefer language to be efficient and not having to say nens and nenas. It's yeah. very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. Thank so, you, Martha. Thank you. Maybe we need to leave it here because we are well past the time. It was a very interesting uh, talk and discussion. So, uh, Marta, you will be available to talk with uh, some people that have requested afterwards, right? They have some slots to talk to you. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much for inaugurating the remote uh, Bioinfo for Women and Severatural Research Seminars. <laughs> Thank Virtual you. applause. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. I'm not sure if I have to close this, Alba, or just... As you wish, Marta. Okay. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you, especially to Marta. Um, okay, let's let's meet again. The sooner the better. Okay. Thank you all and take care.